All right, we're live. Part three of objections. Uh, one of my favorite things about uh, uh, objections is if there were no objections in a sales cycle, everybody would be in sales. And then we'd just have so much competition because everybody would be buying everything. Uh, some people think objections are a bad thing. And my thoughts on that is they're missing the big picture. If your prospect raises an objection, it's a good sign. The fact that they're t talking to you about their concern means that they're giving you a chance to answer it. If someone's completely uninterested in our collection services, they won't bother to object. They might just sit through your presentation in silence with their arms folded and then send you away, oh, I'm not interested. Um, today, today we're going to go over the, the, the last few objections that, uh, that we missed out on in, in the last couple of hangouts on objections. Um, before we get into those, I just want to say a, a few things about objections. First, listen to the objection. You know, don't don't jump all over the prospect as soon as he says. But what about? Give him a chance to explain exactly what's on his mind. Don't just tune him out. Listen. You can pick up some really valuable clues from the way a prospect phrases his or her objection, and of course, you know, say it back to the prospect. Uh, when, when you're absolutely sure the prospect is done talking, you know, repeat, repeat back the gist of what he said. Something like, "Oh, I see. Uh, you're you're concerned about contingency fees." And this engages. It shows you're both listening, and it it gives your prospect a chance to clarify. And your prospect may say, well, it's, it's not so much the cost I'm worried about as, as, as much as, you know, what, what the yields may be or, or the time it's going to take me to place the account. And we both know it only takes a few seconds to place an account. And, I mean, yields, well, that's, that's a gift. Um, also, you know, sometimes the first objections aren't the prospect's real concern. Many prospects don't want to admit that they can't afford your product, so they'll raise all sorts of other objections instead. So, before, before you, you, you get into answering an objection, explore the reasoning. Ask a few questions. You know, is collection time and status updates a particular issue? Have you had trouble with that before? See if you can draw the prospect out a bit. And, you know, once once you understand the objection completely, you can answer it. Usually when, when a, a prospect or potential client raises an objection, they're actually expressing fear. So your task at this point is to relieve the fears. If you have it, some specific examples, um, you know, a, a story from an existing client or, or some type of statistics, present that. Uh, hard facts will always make a response stronger. And, you know, check back with the prospect to to, to confirm that you've answered their objection fully. And you can do that by saying, you know, have I, have I answered your concerns? Or does that make sense? 
and, you know, of course, bring the prospect back into the flow of the presentation, you know. So most of the time when, when a prospect raises an objection, you're in the middle of your presentation. So, you know, once, once a prospect raises an objection and you've answered it, make a, a quick mental summary of what you've been talking about before you move on. And, and of course, when you finish your, pro, your, your presentation, check to see if the prospect has any other objections so you can begin closing the sale. Uh, now, the, the, things, the things we're going to look at today is the prospect is too busy to give the names of accounts. Uh, prospect has never heard of Lions and Associates. Or the prospect objects to our rates. They claim, oh, they're too high. You know, somebody else called me about a collection service and they said they can do it for half of what you're charging. I, I've actually gotten this. And, you know, the, the, the question at that point is, you know, what was that salesperson selling rate or were they selling service? You know, um, some of the other things are a prospect gives all accounts to an attorney or, or he uses NACM, they have accounts insured or they, or they sell only on COD. Um, these are some of the miscellaneous things that we'll run into from time to time. So we'll, we'll just start at the first one. Okay. Your prospect is too busy to give account. So now this may or may not be true. It might be another star to dump on you. Whatever the situation is, the objection has to be acknowledged. And you can do this in most cases by using the, the feel, felt, found approach. You know, when making, making statements like, I know exactly how you feel because many companies have felt exactly the same way. But when they took a few minutes to place accounts with us, they found that those few minutes were one of the best investments of their time that they ever made. That's a strong point. Because the, 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 the fact is, we're going to collect some of those accounts. We won't collect everyone, but we are going to generate some money on business placed. Um, we can also emphasize that we're a fast action agency. And tell them, look, all I, all I need is the company name, amount owed, phone number, responsible party to talk to, and we can get started. Um, of course, we are going to need all of the things that are on the placement checklist. However, these these few things are are something that we can use to get started to do a preliminary workup on the company that we're going after and. You know, the, the collector can begin to pretext it. Um, another thing, is, of course, that is basically piggybacking on fast action. Tell the prospect, we'll go to work for them immediately. What's the first name and phone number you can give me? And get their response. Um, also, you always want to assure the prospect that it only takes a few minutes to give us the, the information on the accounts, the names, numbers, and you, you can suggest that if, if he doesn't have, have the time, give the assignment to one of his subordinates and have them give you the accounts. You know, that's actually what, what some of my clients do. They are completely strapped for time, so 
they give one of their subordinates the okay to place whatever accounts in, you know, that that person will either go online through our portal and, and place the accounts or they'll fax them or email them over to me. Um, of course, we want to acknowledge the fact that the prospect is a busy person. Most successful people are busy. I know I am. I'm busy all the time. And, you know, that's, that's part of, of being successful. You can't be successful without being busy. Um, if the prospect persists in, in saying that he's simply too busy to give the accounts over, ask him what time will be more convenient for him to do so, get the time and date, and follow up with him. And, of course, make sure you let that prospect know that he or she needs to gather the accounts up for when you call them back. You know, hey, look, look I'm going to call you back at so-and-so date and time. Uh, please have the accounts ready for placement. And don't, don't have them call you. Make sure you tell them I'm calling you back. Okay? And send them an email with the key discussion points and the follow-up date to remind them, hey, on the 12th, I'm going to be knocking on your door, buddy. Have the stuff ready. Okay. Now, sometimes we're going to run into prospects that have never heard of us. And, you know, believe it or not, there will be prospects out there who have never heard of Lions and Associates. And the objection here is that since they are in a, a, a credit extending business and have never heard of Nines and Associates, they're not exactly sure what we can do for them. And, you know, sometimes it might be a ploy just to get you off of the phone. Uh, sometimes you will run into a prospect who has heard of, of us and when you run into those, they'll have some accounts ready for you, believe me. Uh, but anyway, when the situation occurs that they say they've never heard of us, you want to make your full presentation, stressing the benefit of what our private investigator network and other featured services will do for the prospect. Give them a demonstration of our online access that we give to every client. We don't pick and choose who gets it. They don't have to hound us for it. They get it. This allows them to keep track of their placements and it also allows them to keep track of their yield with us. And, you know, of course, tell them why our yield is three times the industry average. Three times. Three hundred percent more. That's a big number. I know I could find something to do with 300% more money. <laughs> um, also, you're going to want to explain to them what fee added collections can do to offset the cost of third party collections and that we actually get the fees paid on more than half of the accounts that we collect. We can actually make them whole on many accounts. Sometimes it's free. I mean, how good is that? That's incredible. Um, another thing to take into consideration is, is the cost-benefit ratio or, or benefit-cost ratio on accounts that require third-party collection efforts. Um, the, the benefit to cost ratio is, of course, going to be higher than they would get at a typical agency or an average agency because we're going to collect more money for them. 
and when you explain this, use picture words so that the prospect can visualize exactly what we can do for them. Then, as you proceed through your presentation, use all the techniques that we've been discussing and, you know, of course, handle any any other objections that come out. And in in addition to the the standard collection agency efforts, which are direct mail and phone calls. Those those are the main ones. Well, direct mail, fax, and phone calls. Um, in addition to these things. We have online access for our clients. Our yields are enormously higher. We remit fast. We meet with debtors face to face, eyeball to eyeball. Some other agencies do that, but it's not as common as you might think it would be. We also do financial investigation. So we actually investigate the companies that we're collecting from and of course we have local attorneys that work for us that that do demands for us and also handle litigation for us in any jurisdiction in the United States so it doesn't matter where the debtor is we've got a lawyer that can slap them around We've got a PI that can come out and meet with them eyeball to eyeball, face to face, and that's going to collect more money. It always has and it always will. Now, using this type of service typically means that we don't negotiate rates as much as the other guys do. A lot of guys think they're working at a uh, appliance store where the customer can go any place on the strip and get the same product so they gotta beat the price, gotta beat the price. We're not trying to beat the price because they get more. Okay, and it cost us a lot more money to do collections the way we do. So this may sometimes bring up the objection that our rate is too high. Now, before we look into that, let's look at our rate schedule. It is competitive and it is pretty much the same as, as what they're going to find at any other agency. The, the only difference is we're not going to break wheat and reduce our rate because some other non-effective agency is willing to go after their business and make a few phone calls for 10%. Well, oh, good. Place the account with them. You want somebody's number? I'll give it to you. And <laughs> I actually do this. I will do this if a client or, or a potential client is is trying to hang me out to dry on a rate? I'll say more. I think the best thing for you to do is call somebody else, and I can give you someone's number who can give you a rate that low. Now, if you find that they cannot be effective for that rate. Once, once they've exhausted their phone calls and letters, you can place the account with us as a second placement. Now, of course, second placements are going to be charged as second placement, and it's going to cost you more money if, if they're unsuccessful. Further, I can't, I can't recommend their service. I can only tell you that I know they're charging lower rates. Um, and that their yield average is, well, below average. Average is around 15%. Actually, it's 11.7 to 15%. I 
read several industry reports that fall between those numbers. So the, the, the fact is they're going to get a better deal with us no matter how they look at it. Okay, it, it's, it's a BCR thing, benefit to cost ratio. It's a ROI without an upfront investment. How good is that? Now, sometimes when they raise this objection, it, it may be just a question as, what are your rates? The first thing we want to do on rates is ask qualifying questions. Because we don't want to quote them any rates until we know what they're going to be placing. So if, if, if the prospect asks about rates, this can be an excellent time for a trial close or a standard close to ask for accounts to be placed for collection. And of course, you want to tell them about fee added collections and how it's going to benefit them. By asking the qualifying questions, you're going to get some idea of what rate you can charge, and you can equate it to any other type of discount buy. In other words, the higher the volume, the lower the unit price. I'll say this again, the higher the volume, the lower the unit price. If they have a portfolio of a million dollars to place with you, we can give them some commission points off. We can give them points off on the rates. Okay? Um, in other situations, you can ask the prospect to go pull several accounts or pull their agent. Have them give you the age of the accounts and the balances. Now, you're in a position to quote a rate. And in fact, at this point, you can move right into asking for the placements. Okay, now, if, if you've done this and the prospect still says the rate is too high, you may have to negotiate. Okay, so simply ask the prospect what do you think a fair rate would be on the types of accounts we have been discussing? Let them give you a figure. If it's in the ballpark and it's something we can live with, accept his proposal or, you know, maybe go a little higher, give a counter, and ask him to place additional accounts with it. Look, if I'm going to do this for you, do this for me. So, in, in, in most cases, when, if, if you get into rate negotiations, you will have to negotiate a rate higher than what the prospect gives you as, as his fair rate. Uh, and, uh, again, we want to always, we want to always sell service before we sell rate. And, of course, if you can't reach an agreement, let them know. We're not a nonprofit organization. We have to make a profit just like they do. Okay, without profit, one cannot stay in business. And explain why we cannot go below a certain rate. And if he's an astute business person, person, and, you know, sometimes you might be assuming too much. Uh, don't understand the logic of your position. You know, basically, you get what you pay for. You know, ask, ask him when the last time was that he walked in to a luxury car dealership and asked them to match the price of a non-luxury car. Basic knowledge, you know, or if 
if you get a steak at a diner, is it going to be as good as a steak at a steakhouse that's known for those steaks? No. No. Because you don't go to the pancake guy to get a steak. <laughs> because if you do, you know what you're going to get. Um, and if the prospect still objects and, and you feel there's a likelihood that a special rate arrangement would be profitable to Lions and Associates, make an educated decision. Get the placements. However, this does not mean to take a lowball rate. Um, always, always consult uh, either myself or 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 another manager when when you're going lower on rates because well one one point is each commission point that's dropped on our agent fee agency fee is going to directly affect your commission because we get paid on fee not gross placement so the general rule is don't quote rates until you have specific information about specific accounts. Then you can qualify, determine rates, and even get the accounts for placement if, if it's handled properly. Um, sometimes you're going to find a, a client that uses one of the Large agencies, and I, I, I'm not I, I'm not going to name them. But if 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 you Google biggest collection agency, you can probably figure out who some of them are. Um, there there's a couple out there that that are big as far as people, and they do a ton of volume, but their yields are extremely low. Um, When you run in, into something like this, acknowledge that you understand that a lot of businesses use, you know, whoever they say they're using. And on, on some of these companies, their, their main business is compiling references and credit reports on business. So, therefore, they can't really afford to offend anybody. Consequently, the collection approach may not be as persistent as the prospect would like. Some of these companies will even go as far as hearing from a debtor that there's a dispute on the debt. And they close the account. They don't attempt to arbitrate the dispute, they just close it. That's not a good thing. That means money is left on the table. Okay. Um, also, you know, when, when you run into something like this, ask the prospect, are you looking to retain the goodwill of your debtor or are you looking to get the money? And I mean, we can do it either way. You know, we can we can send the send the debtor back to them as a customer or you know we can use a standard collection approach and well pretty much do what we need to do to get the money um, also you'll want to ask the prospect whether they'd rather have an agency that is concerned with just one thing collecting his money or if they're concerned with, you know, keeping goodwill with with the majority of businesses in the U.S. Okay, and you don't have to necessarily suggest that that they give up one of these big guys. That's also a you know credit reporting company as well as a collection company. Suggest that he continue to use them for credit reporting services, and you know maybe place some of your accounts with them, some with us. Let's see who does better. 
but make sure your prospect knows that he owes it to himself to use an agency which has been specializing in commercial collections for many years and is run by people who have done this for decades. Okay, the, the executives of this company, me, between me and, and my two other executives, we have combined over a century of experience and it's not just combined experience in the exact same thing. For example, my particular expertise is in construction stuff. Susan's is in insurance. Tom's is in transportation. Okay? We, we've all been in financial industries for a very long time, commercial collections specifically. And with our collectors being guided with this, this type of experience, that means we collect more money, okay? Um, also, you can let the prospect know that unlike some of these guys that are basically credit reporting companies, there's no cost up front when they place accounts with us. There's no membership dues. We only get paid if they get paid. And I mean that the value in that is, is clear. Uh, let's talk about attorneys. This is pretty much the same as when a prospect tells you that he uses other agencies. You want to qualify. You want to see if you're going to e even be able to get your foot in the door. So the first thing you want to do when he says, ah, I sent all my stuff to an attorney. Okay. How many accounts on a monthly, quarterly, or annual, annual basis? You know, you're going to base these questions on the size of the prospect company. You know, if they're a, a, a mom and pop place, you know, how many accounts do you send them a year? <laughs> If they're a medium-sized company, what do you send to them in a quarter? If they're a big company, what, what are you sending your lawyer every month? What's the average balance of these accounts? When do you turn them over to your attorney? And with this kind of information, you can go on to determine the needs of this prospect. And you will find that a number of your prospects use attorneys to handle their accounts. Now, these may be in-house attorneys, or attorneys that are employed on a retainer basis. And what this means is perhaps they're just asking their attorneys to write a demand letter, and if that doesn't work, obtain a judgment against the debtor. Now, judgments are fine if the debtor has some assets from which the judgment can be satisfied, and the client is willing to wait for the judgment to be obtained. Um, if you guys have ever been involved in it uh, or, or have knowledge of commercial lawsuits, guys, they take forever. I mean, a long time. Okay? Um, Additionally, in a lot of cases, the judgments are obtained in the prospect's county. Okay, if the debtor's in a different jurisdiction, the judgment has to be transferred to the debtor's county, sometimes in another state where the assets have to be found. Attorneys do not fly around the country suing people or companies. They don't. That's not what they do. They go to court, they talk to the judge, have their paralegal do most of the work, and you know, that's, that's, that's what they do. 
in a lot of these instances, the prospect is going to state that they have their attorney on retainer and that he gets paid whether or not he does any work. And you don't want to insult the prospect for this arrangement, even though it's not the best business decision. But you should educate the prospect and let them know while the attorney is being paid on retainer, there's additional court costs. And if the legal action becomes rather involved, the lawyer is going to ask for additional fees for his time. Attorneys are paid for their time and effort, not results. You know, unless, unless it's one of these person, personal injury guys you see on the TV that says, you know, I don't get paid unless you do. Let's go chase that ambulance. So, some of the points you want to use are place the accounts with Lions and Associates before they're sent to the attorney. It's not going to cost you anything. If we can't collect, you don't pay a dime. And then you can still send it to your lawyer for collection. But emphasize that because of our experience in collecting past due accounts, less than 1% of the accounts placed with us are recommended for litigation. Guys, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, we can hear you, Mike. We just okay. can't see you. Okay. There we go. Okay, I, I, was, I was trying to figure out there why, uh, why I disappeared off of the screen and then I clicked something and it said I was muted and gone from the broadcast. My goodness. I thought Rodney came in and made me disappear, man. <laughs> um, anyway, let's. Uh, um, I, 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 I was just going to say I am that good, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, anyway, when when we're when we're talking about placing the accounts with us before they're sent to an attorney. Emphasize, because of our experience in collecting past due accounts, less than 1% of the accounts placed with us are recommended for litigation, and it's not going to cost anything to place the accounts with us. If we can't collect, you don't pay a dime. Of course, if, you do, if we do collect, there's a contingency fee. Fairly so. Um, another point to make on on these lawyers, on the on the prospects that are using their their attorney, obtaining judgment requires a considerable length of time. Uh, this is <laughs> this is something I was just saying because because of this time period that it's going to take to obtain the judgment, and and believe me, they got to serve that debtor before they even get a court date, which sometimes takes three months, sometimes longer. Okay, during that time period, debtor might go out of business, file bankruptcy, skip to some place he can't be located. Hell, he might move down to Panama, take everybody's money so he can go retire and go fishing for the rest of his life. Who knows? In fact, starting legal action right now might push the debtor into bankruptcy. Then nobody gets anything. Hence, the judgment is of no value. So, it's much better to have lines and associates personally visit the debtor to collect the money immediately. Not 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 a year down the road. Okay. Now, there are some credit management associations that some credit managers belong to that also 
provide a collection service. Okay. Um, now these guys, just as with with the ones that are actually credit reporting agencies. Uh, the 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 customer that the client's going after may also be a member of these credit management associations. Hence, that association's collection department has to be aware of this and may not exert the necessary pressure to collect the account for fear of losing a member. Guys, this is important. Really? You use a credit management association? Man, I hope your debtor doesn't belong to them too because, goodness, they might not put forth the effort necessary to collect your money. Now, you don't want to point that out the same way I just did because you may indicate to the prospect that, hey, man, you're making a terrible business decision. Okay, slap yourself in the face for being stupid. <laughs> but uh, particularly these associations are public relations minded. Okay, while, while they do have some interest in collecting the client's money, they have a very keen interest in making sure they ruffle no one's feathers. Oh my goodness. I hope we don't make them mad. Therefore, at best, they exert a very weak collection effort. Yes, weak, very weak. It's awful. Okay, and this is the kind of information you want to convey to your prospects who offer the objection that they use some type of credit management association for collection purposes. And you know, don't don't point the finger like I just did. It's just yes, I was unprofessional by doing that, but. I'm over it. <laughs> now, accounts that are insured. This is a legitimate objection. Some of your prospects contract with an insurance carrier to insure their accounts against delinquency. This means that once the insurance premium is paid, the account becomes past due, then the insurance carrier will pay the balance on the account or a portion of it. Uh, when and how this is done will depend on the insurance contract. It may be at the end of 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, or even more delinquency. Um, sometimes they only pay a certain percentage of the balance and in these situations, although it can be a legitimate objection, you want to be sure that it is a legitimate objection. So you want to ask, do they insure all of their accounts? Are there some that are not insured? Okay, because remember, the insurance company wants to minimize their risk. That's how they stay profitable, by minimizing risk. So if they tell you not all of them are insured, hey, let's talk about these to see if there are any delinquencies in these accounts and of course ask them to place them. Also, you can find out if the insurance company only pays a part of the balance. If so, inquire how the unpaid portion is collected and ask for those balances to be placed for collection. Um, and, and sometimes there's a slim possibility of obtaining accounts when, when a prospect says, oh, I have everything insured. However, but, you know, asking uh, a couple of questions, like I just stated, um, you'll at least know if, if there is or is not any business there. And, of course, if there's not, get rid of it. Okay, now, some of your prospects are going to sell or claim to sell only on COD. And 
you know, the, the ones who legitimately do this, it's because of their business experience. Uh, not, not business experience, meaning they are a guru. Um, it means that they've been burned a lot in the past, and now they only sell on COD. Now, the first point on this is it restricts their ability to sell because most companies want credit terms. Okay, you can point out to the prospect that if he had an efficient way to collect his money, us, he could afford to adopt a credit policy and sell on open accounts. Now, most of the time, this won't change the prospect's method of doing business, but it'll give them something to think about. Um, additionally, COD stands for cash on delivery. Some people call it check on delivery, but most of the time, these CODs are paid by a check. And in a number of cases, these checks bounce. Therefore, when a prospect says, well, I only sell on COD, okay, no problem. Do you have any NSF checks? And if so, give them to me. You know, have them describe what they are and ask them to place them with you for, for collections. So, what, what we want to mainly realize here is your objections, normal part of selling. Um, and three, three of the steps that, that you want to use every time in your objections that you face day in and day out. One, know the answers to your objections. Two, know the technique for overcoming them. Three, know when to use the techniques. Okay, so before you, before you handle an objection, you have to know the answer. No amount of skill and techniques for overcoming objections can make up for a lack of information. So it's important to know who we are, what we do, how we do it, all of that good stuff. And you know, most of this can be obtained in our, our training documentation. So there's certainly never any excuse for not knowing this stuff. And for objection, the simplest method is writing down your objections. What are you running into? Write them down. Think about it. Work out the best plausible answer to each one. Okay, because you should prepare your own responses to objections. Um, I'm not necessarily saying get completely off, off course. But what, I, what I'm saying is, you know, take, take what we're learning here and put it into your own words. And when they are in your own words, they will sound more convincing to your prospect. This is why we want to do that. Um, additionally, as you write out an answer for your objections, there's no way to avoid find getting some, some technique mixed in with it, you know, finding ways to overcome it. And also, when, when you hear other objections that, that we haven't gone over, write them down. Let's go over them. Of all of the steps in inside sales, properly handling objections is absolutely the most difficult to master. But once you do, and you do it well, your success will far outweigh your failures in this. So, some of the things that that we can use as techniques for overcoming objections, and I I I, I know some of you might laugh when I say this first one. If if you've had any heated conversations with me, 
watch your temper. <laughs> I know I get touchy. I get mad sometimes. But the, the, the point is, if you do this with a prospect, the prospect can set you off with an unreasonable objection. And honestly, letting the prospect know how stupid, unfair, or how untruthful he is, while it may satisfy your urge and whatever emotion that you're experiencing at that time, it won't get any accounts placed with you. So it, it, it's something to think about. Stay cool and calm. It's, it, it's something I uh, <laughs> constantly battle with. Cool and calm is, is not my best asset. Uh, another thing, listening uh, attentively. Let the prospect get the objection out of his system. Don't cut him off with clever answers. I know we have them. As he hears himself talk, his objections sometimes sound less and less important. But if, if you jump right in, he's going to defend himself and magnify those objections. So just listen. Don't interrupt. Listen to what he says. Go back in with a rebuttal. And when you do it, make suggestions, uh, not arguments. Um, you want to cooperate with, with your prospect. Um, I, I find myself battling a lot, and it's, it's the collector in me that makes me want to go to battle. I love going to battle, man. It's awesome. But the point is, few people are convinced by an argument. Um, when you make suggestions to a prospect, you lead your prospect to come to their own conclusion. There's a uh, axiom that that some of you may have heard: win an argument and lose a sale. Uh, another point is we we can convert objections into a question. Questions invite answers, while objections sometimes invite arguments. If you convert a prospect's objections into a question, you can answer it smoothly and without proving that he's wrong, and I, I know it's tempting sometimes to prove your prospect wrong, but if you prove him wrong, you'll embarrass him and force him to hold his stance. Uh, the, 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 the questions you want to use are like cushion and probe type questions. Uh, Sometimes you want to cushion the objection before before asking before answering it. Uh, a cushion is a uh, I understand how you feel. Others have felt the same way, but they found that by using my Lions and Associates as their collection agency, they have dramatically increased their recovery of delinquent accounts. And this this type of technique is the feel, felt, found that I talked about before. Um, you know, the, oh, I understand. Absolutely. You know, you have a right to question the rates that we charge and why we aren't too fast on negotiating. And I understand how you feel. You're, 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 you're feeling what they're saying and you're finding a solution. Feel, felt, fine. And these techniques will cushion your response to the objection. It doesn't put you in the prospect into a win-lose situation. It puts you into a win-win situation. Um, the the other the other the other thing you want to do is probe. Um, for example, in addition to 
whatever their objection is. Is there anything else that will prevent you from giving us your accounts today? Okay, and that's that's the same, almost the same as the the other one that I, I, I stated. I, I'll bring it up probably more than you like to hear it. Is there anything stopping you from placing the accounts now? And of course, you know, they say, no, there's nothing stopping me. Good. Give me the accounts. I got my pen right here. Talk to me. All right. Let's write them down. Who's the debtor? Who's the contact person at the debtor company? What's their address, number, balance, date of my sale? Um, you know, other, other, other probing things. Or there must be some good reason you want to wait before placing the accounts with us. May I ask what that is, or what it is? Um, other, other probing questions you want to ask is what would it take to get us doing business? Or what is it that you need to think about? Or simply, what would you suggest? You know, just supposing we could do what you say, you'd want to go ahead and, and give us the accounts today, wouldn't you? Then, from these, you can ask questions which get an, a, a, a reaction from the prospect. Um, does that answer your question? How do you feel about that? Don't you agree? Does that make sense? Doesn't that make our services worth looking at? That's an important one. And once you've handled the objections in that way, then proceed again to a close. And always after handling every objection, go to a features benefit close. You know, and, and close it. Once you've handled every objection, if you do a feature benefit close, nine times out of ten it works. Um, something we've talked about before is postponing the answer to objections. Now, I've, I've stated that, you know, if you can't answer it, you know, tell the prospect you'll get back to them, or, or sometimes when answering object an objection, you want to give a, a pause you know, to show that you're actually contemplating the, the prospect's objection. Um, but you also, you want to handle the objection at once. And I know to some this may seem like it makes no sense. Mike, I thought you said think about it. Yeah, I said think about it. Think about it and handle it. <laughs> Um, a lot of times you're going to find situations where you want to postpone the answer to an objection. Uh, for example, if it's a petty objection or, or if it's, it's one that's going to be answered later in your sales interview, right? Because you're, you're interviewing them for the sale. But if you meet the objection the moment it's raised, you're going to overcome it and get that prospect to listen to the rest of your presentation. Okay? And the, the reason you always want to do this is you do not want that prospect to keep thinking about that objection while you're presenting something else to them. Because he might not be listening to what you're telling him. He might be thinking about that objection. Or he might think that 
you're searching for an answer and, and lose confidence. So, what, where, where are we at with, with questions so far? Well, about, about any, anything in the realm of objections. Okay, if you guys come up. Oh, we got Edward coming on. Talk to me, Edward. Okay, I've been I've been calling and uh, I just I get to run around when I I tell them that I'm gonna uh, or that when I when I tell them you know about our serv the services and stuff like that and then they say they're doing in house and I ask them for their recovery you know how much is say well good um, well, how much is your 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 percentage of your yield right you know it, or I can't. I reward it differently probably every time, but I'll say, well, what what kind of recovery do you do you do you have, or or what's the the yield percentage for you guys? And they'll say, well, you know, we do all right. They don't always answer me up front, and then I'll try to get the percentage out, you know. And usually they give me a runaround. Well, where do you find, you know? I, I I think why don't you just send me a brochure or something like that, you know? And then I'll look it over. I never. Okay. I never get to, to actually close them on anything, you know, or okay. get further than that to convince them. Okay, what you want to do, and and this is this is something, and and you're you're going into the qualifying, but you want to ask them specifically, or or approximately, how many ninety plus accounts do you carry on your agent? Agent sheet, and you know, before before you go in, in into all of that, you want you want to take control of the conversation. Okay, this is this is the main the main reason some of us get the runaround in the conversation. It's it's because we don't have control of the conversation, and we need to earn the right to qualify. Okay, and we. We do this by engaging the prospect, by by using psychology. Um, these guys are telling you that you know they're doing pretty good. They're they're not necessarily collecting everything, but you know they're they're doing all right, man. They're they're happy with what they're doing in house. Compliment them. Compliment them that they're using their in-house collectors to collect their accounts. You know, let them know they're you're doing a fantastic job. Awesome. When do you guys consider them dead? How many ninety? How many ninety plus accounts are you carrying on your aging sheet? What are you writing off each year? You know, and. And when you're asking them about their aging sheet, what is the approximate number of accounts that are on your aging sheet now that have not paid according to the terms of the sale? Okay, and you can also ask them how many how many open accounts do they have? Um, these types of questions will determine if there's a need for our services. Then you know, of course, you're you're going to try to get some additional information. If they tell you they do it in house, who does the collecting? You know, is it a is it their salesperson collecting it, or do they have an actual collection department? Um, you'll want to try to get some feel for what their methods are and how effective their collection methods are. You know what? What are they using? What are they doing? They sending letters, making phone calls. They sending a the guy an email that he's probably marking as spam, so he doesn't have to receive them anymore. Um, if, if you can find out from that credit manager what percentage of delinquent accounts they can live with, and then find out if they're within those limits.
you can find out how much business they have just by simply asking them, you know, hey, what can you live with? Are you within these limits? And most of them are going to tell you, yeah, yeah, we're within the limits. So, okay. So what are you writing off annually? What can you do with extra money? Um, sometimes, sometimes you're going to have a credit manager that actually does the in-house collecting themselves. Um, when this happens, and, and just so you know, the primary role of a credit manager is to approve credit requests made by the sales department. Okay, if this credit manager's spinning his or her wheels on these collection accounts, you know, yes, yes, work them in house for a little while. You know, even if you work them to death, we we'll work them until they're 120 days old, and then send them to us. You know, you're just going to write them off anyway. What if you can collect some of that money? But also by collecting those accounts through us, this credit manager can increase the number of customers that their salespeople can sell to. Okay, this is a tool that can help them create additional sales for their company because the credit manager can now begin focusing on approving credit. And these facts alone will gain that credit manager prestige among the sales force as well as with his or her superiors. Because credit management and sales are always at ends. All, well, not always. Some companies have found ways to overcome this, but there are so many companies out there that have credit managers and sales departments that have friction with one another. Okay, and if you can get that prospect to get out his aging list and find out what accounts are seriously delinquent, you can get that, that prospect to place those accounts. If you can get them to pull up that aging list while you're on the phone, you can get the accounts from them, you can close that deal. And that's that's the main thing that that we're looking to do here is get get the accounts replacement. Um, another thing to do is is find out about their red flag accounts. You know, who keeps breaking promises? Who doesn't respond to letters and phone calls or respond to ten day demands? Who's neglecting your email? Who's never in when you call? Those are some red flags, and if if you can get your prospect to talk about these, you can get them to place the accounts nine times out of ten. Um, Edwin, what else? What else are you running into? Um, that's my main problem. You know, I get him to to tell me. Most of the time, recently, over the holidays, it's been a lot different than the first week when I was working because there were so many people on vacation and stuff, and they, you know, I, I'd either get somebody else that doesn't normally handle it because the other person's on vacation or what, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm, that's, I'm just, or I'm just getting people to say, hey, you know, we never have any problems. Other than that, I, I only, the ones I do talk to, they give me the runaround, you know, they're saying, well, yeah, you know, um, we like to take care of that ourselves. We don't get very many, and then they'll just, you know, I mean, they won't tell me how, you know, how long the their their counts are. If, you know, I had a, a couple yesterday that were good ones, and um, I've been making more contacts. A lot. Well, I've been putting my my contacts into my warm leads because I didn't do that the first week. That's why it looks like I didn't have a lot of contacts because. The first week I wasn't making notes. I was just making, putting them in callbacks instead of putting them in the interest parted. You know my prospects. But um, I'm just getting those are the main objections that I get for so far that I can't deal with. The other ones they'll send me. You know they'll they'll say 
they'll tell me how old the ones are, but they'll tell me that you know they're only thirty or six. They're only like thirty days. They're not up to sixty days yet, or whatever. But the ones that don't tell me how how old they are, this or that, you know, they just gave me a runaround, like I was saying. Okay. And whenever they give you a runaround, that's a point to get you off of the phone. Um, the prospects trying to make you believe there's no need for your service, so you'll back off, hang up, and he can go on about his business. Okay. I live in the real world. The fact of the matter is, a company selling on open accounts doesn't have any need, really. Man, can you FedEx me some of that stuff that you're smoking? I would love to be that high. <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> you may get a negative response, um, but what 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 you can do, and, and this is this is something I've I've always done. Express surprise. Um, if if you can get them to let you probe a little further, you you'll find out that that there are. That there are going to be some accounts there. Um, if you express surprise and let them know that your experience has indicated that most companies in whatever industry they're in who sell on an open account basis have some percentage of delinquency. You know, and quote a percentage if you feel comfortable with it. Quote, you know, whatever you're running into. You told me some of these guys are telling you four and five percent. Man, that's bad. Four and five percent, they need to send that stuff over. They need to collect that money. Because that four or five percent is gnawing away at their profits. It's like Pac Man, waka, 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 waka. God, that, I'm showing my age now. <laughs> uh, I had a guy yesterday, and he just, I probably could have closed him on the spot, but he just wanted to wait. He said, you know, I've got a guy that's giving me a problem. You know, it's out past 60 days. He said, but I want to wait a couple weeks on it. Before I, you know, before I decided to go to an agency because he wanted to try on him, try whatever he could do himself first, you know, and I, I couldn't convince him to to close that day yesterday. Okay. He had two accounts. And both of them were 60 days old? Yes. Okay. Well, call him back in a week. Ask him how, you know, ask him what he's doing to collect. Ask him how it's working out for him, you know. Chances are he's going to do the same thing he's been doing for the past 60 days, which is calling the debtor up. Hi, this is Bob. You owe me money. Please pay me. Please call me back. Here's my number, 800. Um, yeah. He's probably doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. A lot of people do that. Um, so call him back in a week. Find out how it's working out for him. Find out what methods he's using. And ask him, you know, do you, do you think a, uh, a visit from one of our PIs would help you collect your money faster? Yeah. You know, he's probably going to tell you something like, oh, man, I, I can't afford to be sending PIs out and all of that stuff. And the, the, the bottom line is, when we do that, it's our expense, not his. Of course, he pays us for our service, a percentage of whatever we collect. But the the main thing on this stuff is to get these accounts in before before they get to a point where where the company's 
in serious dire straits. Um, one, once once they wait till that point, well, they could risk not getting paid anything at all. Um, Reiner. What's happening, dude? Oh, been taking care of a couple things here the last uh, few days. Yeah? Yeah. Shoot, you shot some fireworks for the fourth, man? Oh, did we ever? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Fourth July if you don't have fireworks. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just had to take care of a couple issues that came up the last couple of days. wasn't on the phone yesterday at all, but uh, I'll be on the phone today. Okay, all right. All right. Well, I, wa I, wa I wasn't asking you when you're getting on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know. I, I gotta gotta get on the phone, but uh, yeah, you know it's. Uh, same old, same old. Nothing ever changes, you know. Same, same objections basically all the time. Once you get them mastered, then uh, it becomes much easier. Just don't want to buy into their garbage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they definitely have plenty garbage for you to buy into. Yeah, but it doesn't pay the bills very well. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 definitely not. Yeah. Right. Well, man, I, I I can't believe we're only left with two participants here. At least at, at least we've got a couple of viewers out there. That's that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, you know, at least I know who wants to learn, and who doesn't give a damn about learning. <laughs> so you know when uh, when it when it comes time to uh, see well I, I'm not even going to get into that not even get into that uh, before we close do we have any any questions about objections or actually questions let, let, let let's Let's do a one-time open up for questions about anything. You have any question that that you can ask me? What is it? <laughs> no, I'm good. I I just need a dial today. <laughs> That's it. That's I'll, it. I'll tell you Friday what happens this week. All right, cool. And get get control of those conversations. Reiner, Reiner can help you uh, develop ways to take control of the conversation. It, it, it seems it, it seems like um, that's one of the things you're running into. I, I'm not. I haven't sat and listened to you on the phone, so I can't say for sure. But it, from what you're telling me, it sounds a little bit like you're you're having some issues getting complete control of the conversation and that's that's something that's going to come with with time doing this um, also of course product knowledge and uh, those those things are going to build your confidence in this and you know it's just a matter of, of Keeping control of the conversation and uh, getting the prospect to where to where you want them to be, and you know some some people may look at at that as as a bad thing. A salesman wanting to control the conversation, it's not a bad thing. It keeps it on on scope. It keeps the focus correct. That way, you're not wasting your time, and you're not wasting the prospect's time. It's it's a win-win situation. So, that's one of the purposes for controlling the conversation. The other one is so you can present your product properly, 
efficiently and get the prospects business. That's the name of the game here. So, you, you know, I, I think that uh, one of the reasons that I'm not getting control is because I'm trying to dodge quest their questions, and that makes it harder for me to ask them questions, you know, because I don't have knowledge to answer their questions, so I'm trying to get, I'm trying to bypass it and just, you know, cut cut the sale as short as I can, you know, I guess I, I, I'm, I'm, I think me dodging them, their questions, or trying to, I don't know, I don't, trying to be too soft and, and just kind of simplify the sale a little bit more than I should because I don't have the knowledge, you know. I think that that takes the control away from me. I don't know. Well, what what knowledge what knowledge are you are you lacking? What what in particular? Well, I just don't, I, you know, like a lot of the stuff we went over. I'm sorry to interrupt, but a lot of the stuff we went over was uh I, I haven't memorized it yet. You know, I, I went over through it. You know, I'm I'm familiarized I'm familiarized with it, but I haven't like I, I don't have the confidence to to answer some of their questions and stuff. So I try to I try to keep them from from asking me those questions. You know, I think I don't know. I I don't know. That's just what it seems like. I was when I when I start thinking about it. You know, I think maybe I try to short simplify everything and instead of sitting there and and uh, and really hitting the business to it, you know. Okay. Can I can I make a suggestion to you? Yes. Make a list of of the common objections you're running into, and write down your answers. Um, I, I'd also I, I I want you to to pay some attention to how you feel if someone attempts to sell you a product or a service and anything if you know if you if you go if you go to a car lot to look at a car and uh, you know the, the, the car salesman skirting around the questions you're you're asking are you going to buy from them? And the answer is probably not. What 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 I want to suggest is take down your common objections. Okay, learn them. Learn how to answer them, and you will develop confidence in answering them by getting on the phone and using it. And and you don't you don't want to make it to where it's something you sit up at night trying to memorize. You want to make it something that you have written down. You know, you have you have your notebook and you know you write you write your stuff down and okay, I'm running into this, that, and the other. Okay, and keep it in front of you when you're on the phone. You know, have your, your pages of things and get a feel for presenting those objections back to the prospects because until until you until you begin welcoming the objections you're going to continue to get the runaround um, you're getting you're getting the runaround because you're given the runaround uh, yeah I, I think I'm afraid to engage them I, I think I don't actually engage them into the sale I just kind of like trying to Dodge them, you know. Try to get shoot through the the all the the real complicated stuff and make a simple little thing out of it, you know. Okay. Well, we know we know one thing. You've already closed a sale, so you can do it. There should be confidence yeah. in there. And what? What I what I'd like you to work on is overcoming whatever whatever it is that that's making you fearful. If if, if it's a confidence thing, man, pump yourself up before you get on the phone. You know, you if if you're if you're working here, you've had to have been 
successful selling something somewhere before, you know, before, yeah. before Ron or Hydra. You, you had, I mean, uh, <laughs> you don't, you don't get in the door here with no sales experience. So think about past successes, man. Think about past success. Use that. You want, you want to inflate your own ego a little bit. You want to do that. It's going to help you build confidence and get on the phone and build some momentum with it. Once you build some momentum, you keep the momentum going. And uh, I, I, I'm going to use an example here uh, and, and of an old-time water pump. Okay, you know the old pumps that you got a you got a big old handle on them and. I mean, we're, we're, we're probably going back to the Western days where none of us were alive, but we've probably seen one somewhere before. And if you've ever used one, you have to keep pumping that thing, man, and it's going to trickle out a little bit, and you just got to keep pumping it. And that, that's, that's the stage where you're at. Your business is just it's trickling out a little bit right now because you've got to build momentum, okay? Um, pretty soon, if you keep pumping that handle, man, the water's going to start flowing. And the, the point in this is you want to keep momentum. You want to build momentum and keep it. You keep it going, you'll begin writing more business, you'll begin to gain more confidence, and more importantly, you'll learn how to properly use your objections and you'll be able to overcome these things that are standing in between you and the business right now. Because that's what these things are, man. They're standing there saying, you can't get in here. Get past it. That's, that's at, at any and, and this is anything in life. Anything in life you have a problem with, man, get past it. It can be done. Um, what what else? What else are you having issues with, Edward? Uh, not that's just it. You know, I I, I think I, I got to do like, like you said and write down the notes. And then uh, you know, make sure I, I'm writing down and following along what, with what my objections are. I'm coming up, you know, what kind of objections I'm coming up with, and, and what my answers are. I mean, and then uh, go from there, because I, you know, I'm just I'm just trying to feel around and figure out what works, you know, as far as getting getting from point A to point B in, in the conversation. So. We'll see how that works. After the holidays, now that the holidays over, hopefully I can get back to it because it seems. But it seems like a lot of them are saying they're still on vacation. So, um, hopefully, you know, we'll get through that so I, I can get some conversations in. But I, yesterday was a good lead. I had a good lead. That guy with the two counts. That's pretty good because it's probably better if I wait down next month. You know, 30 days from now, I can. Those will be worth more for me. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is true. Also, that's that's definitely one positive way to look at it. Um, I'm I'm still trying to get a hold of. I got two ladies that had accounts, and they told me they had accounts. And one lady, she said, you know, she had accounts, but her boss makes her do it in house, and they've only been doing about eighty percent on their on their yield. Eighty percent. Yeah. <laughs> She said, but her boss decided. Well, he pays them. That's why he pays them is to get to do that their AR and that that's their job. He consider, considers that their job. Whether and even though he's losing money. So and then I had the other one. She just said she was the one that uh, had the accounts need, needed to run it by her boss. And then when I tried to call her back, they were moving their office from one office to the other, so they were busy. So I'm still trying to get a hold of her. Okay. On on the one 
whose boss says that's what they, he pays them to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm not even going to give you my opinion of him because it's derogatory. <laughs> uh, but there comes a point where the efforts are completely fruitless in, in collecting the accounts in house. So this this guy, if he's been in business for any number of years, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but he sounds like a novice in, in business. And if they're all, if they're doing eighty percent, he's done. He's done. She said they're hurting. <laughs> I know they're hurting. <laughs> they're hurting bad. And I still couldn't. Yeah, she said. Uh, I think I got to look back through my callbacks and see how that was. She gave me the number of her boss, and I couldn't get a hold of him. So. Wow. So I, if I can if I can talk to him, we'll see what what he says. So. Right. Well, if he wants to stay in business. He needs to do something. Otherwise, he's not going to be in business. Okay, if they are losing 20% of their receivables, and it doesn't, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out how bad that is in business, because yeah. that their their net profit is probably have, what what type of business are they? I can't. It was. A, I think it was a construction business. Construction. Okay. So. It may have been shipping. I don't know. I can't remember. It's got. You had to be at one or the other. I'm just trying to remember now if I was which place I was calling. Okay. Well, either either way. Okay. If it's if it's construction or if it's shipping. Their profit margins. Are not very high, okay? They're ten percent at best, okay? Keep in keep in mind that a construction company charges whoever whoever they're doing the job for a premium over what they're paying in labor and over what they're paying in materials, and that's where they get their profits from. Okay. Most of a construction company's money goes into labor and material. Okay, and construction supplies are expensive. Labor is expensive. So. If this guy is losing twenty percent, he's being literally his his company's being eaten alive by bad debt, and it's going to cause him to go out of business if he does not get a handle on it. And while it's easy for him to point the finger at the accounts receivable department saying, "I pay you to do this. This is your job. You better get to work." Guess what? That's not going to make the debtor pay him. That's going to make his AR person get mad at him. And she's going to say, man, screw him. I don't care if he gets paid. I'm going to lunch. I'm going to go meet my girls and go to lunch. And she's going to come back from lunch. I can't believe this a-hole, man, the way, the way he handled me, saying this is my job. I didn't say to give this guy credit and this. And then guess what? She's going to take that attitude onto the phone. And she's going to alienate. She's going to alienate the customers. Now they're not going to return your calls. Oh my goodness, Mr. Boss Man, what type of vicious circle did you just brush up? And that's how it happens. 
That is exactly how it happens. And, and look, these, these situations can literally cripple a company. And we, we've talked about profit and loss on and, and the effect bad debt has on future sales. We, we talked about that a while back. And look, man, this is a serious, very serious situation because if they've got, you know, whatever amount of money they have sitting on the books, if they can't collect it, the only way they're getting that money back is through new sales. And if you're at 20% loss, there is no way to overcome that loss with new sales unless you're doing over a 20% profit. And I can't think of any legal industry that have a higher than 20% net profit. Rhino, maybe, maybe you can help him go and talk some sense into that guy. Yeah. Yeah, the guy's not a very prudent businessman. Yeah, he, he, he needs to uh, he needs to get those accounts over to us now before he loses his behind. Yeah, he'll be putting a for sale sign on the business real quick. Yeah, either that or if he's uh, he's probably got loans or, or whatever to keep him afloat. He has to have some some type of stream of capital that's that's coming in to keep him afloat. While he's running the business into the ground. Oh, my, my bad. Did I say that out loud? Uh, were they in the state of Washington, Edward? Edward, you muted. Uh, uh, he might. That might have been his phone ringing. He's probably. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I was answering the phone. Oh, were they in the state of Washington? I'm. No, I can't even. I think they were in. Uh, Washington uh, is either California or uh, New Mexico. New Mexico, I think it was. Well, you know, a new industry pops up today in Washington. It's legal to sell pot now. <laughs> Maybe he had a little interest in a store in uh, Washington. Yeah. Yeah. Legal to sell pot, man. You know, I've I've got a client that. Uh, Actually, it's not my client, it's Rick's client. We have a client that that does uh, emergency window board ups on, on businesses. And uh, they, they're in California, and of course in California they have pot stores. Man, I have seen so many come across that are pot stores from people breaking in there. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Yeah, I don't know. They just had they had a a business here that was uh, trying to hire twenty new employees, and they did a drug test, and uh, they they've been trying to hire for like three months, and they can't. They're still hiring for twenty new employees because nobody could pass the drug test. <laughs> Big problem. Man, well, if if they can't if they can't find any talent in their industry, maybe they need to uh, revisit their drug testing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they need to allow for some uh, some things and, and get up with the with the times, man. I mean, we're in a time where you know most man, there are, there are a lot of people that that, that smoke weed, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. it's, 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 part, it's part of life, you know? Maybe they're just not offering good enough, good enough benefits to, to actually uh, get sober people to apply for the job, <laughs> too. <laughs> I don't think everybody's that wasted, but you never know. <laughs> and and while, while we're on the subject, man, I, I, don't, I don't wear sunglasses because I'm high. I wear them because... <laughs> Because uh, lights and a computer screen uh, irritates my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so just so you guys know, I didn't smoke a big old 
little fat one before I came to give this presentation. <laughs> but anyway, I guess um, we're good here. If there's nothing else, man, and uh, get on a get on the horn, make some money, get some new clients in, make them happy. And um, anything else before I uh, click stop on here? No. All right. Okay, that's fine. All right. Thank well, you. thank you for tuning in. Have a great day. <laughs>